Hey, people, what is... Uh-oh. ...is up. Thank you for <laughs> exciting, enthralling way, not that boring old bullshit that you normally get from the sales folks, all right? So look, what we're here about is we're going to bring you real, actionable sales insight every two weeks. This is episode 25, 26. What episode? 25. 25. Episode 25. We're cruising. We're super excited because today we have the one and the only Trish Bertuzzi, Ooh. author of the Sales Development Playbook. People, look. If you haven't figured out that sales development is the new transition, is how sales has evolved, get your head out of your ass and stop smoking crack because it, it's, everything has changed. And Trish is the resident expert on this stuff. So pay close attention, guys. Look, I know this could seem like it's going to be a boring show, but I promise you it's not. And you're going to learn stuff that's going to blow up your sales engine. So with that said, Trish, welcome, sister. Welcome. Thank you. So excited to be here. So glad that you finally got blabbed to work. And oh, I'm, I'm ready to rock it. Let's let's share information. We've got some great people in the audience. I want you to participate out there. I demand that you participate. So let's get going. All right, let's get on. So Trish, real quick, tell everybody yeah. who you be. Who you be. Why are you so great? Okay. So I'm great mostly due to genetics, but you know, other than that, I would have to say that I invested, you know, you know, the phrase, learn your craft. Mm -hmm. I have spent 30 years learning this craft. This you were five? Old, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 30 years learning this craft. Proud to say it. I've been doing this since I was five. Yes. So. <laughs> You know, you have to be excited about that because everyone talks about sales development, like it's the hottest job in sales today and it's, you know, an overnight success and it's the biggest thing changing revenue and distribution strategies, but it's been around forever. What it's finally got is the attention it deserves as a critical component of the sales process. So it's been, yeah, 30 years in the making of an overnight success and no one's happier about it than I am because I absolutely love the sales development function. As a matter of fact, right. I think I'm going to I'm going to change my title. I'm going to move it from CEO and I'm going to call myself the chief sales development rep at the Bridge Group. I'm good with that. I think that's a good call. All right, I so you said I something. Do. Okay, so tell us about your book. Okay. I can tell you about book, but you tell us about your book. Okay, so I wrote the book because I was pissed off. Um, you know. Oh snap. Yes. Up. Back it on up, people. I was pissed off because I kept reading all of these people saying, here's what I did at this company. You should do it too. I'm like, okay, but my company is nothing like your company and my clients' companies are nothing like your company. How's that going to work? Or I would hear about a venture capital firm, and there's one in particular in the Boston area that says, here's how you're going to implement this. Go. And then it, it never worked, right? Because they didn't take into account all the variables, like who you're selling to, what's your price point, who are your buyers, are you selling, where are you selling in the technology adopt? There's like a million variables, right? The complexity of the sale. The complexity of the sale and the personality of the sale and the structure of the sale. And, oh, I don't know, how about how your buyers want to friggin' buy? Just Ooh, a thought. This is a novel idea. Yeah, yeah, just a thought. So I got really frustrated. Um, with reading about all that. And then Jill Conrath, who was a dear friend of mine, she just, you know, she'd been bugging me to write a book, bugging me to write a book. And finally she looked at me and she goes, you know, you really are kind of an idiot. She said, you know, you own the space. So just go own the space. I'm like, done. So it took a year because it's really hard, right? It's really hard to yeah. write a book while you're yeah. running a business, but it's here. And the reason I'm excited about it, once again, it's here. It's here. It's here. The, re the reason I'm excited about it is because I meet some amazing sales development executives, and I'm talking amazing, and some of them are on this blab with us, and they get 90% of what needs to be happening, but they're weak in one or two areas. So what I did in the book was say, okay, there are six major elements that you have to own, own like a rock star, to really build a kick-ass team. 
And I think most people own three or four of them, and I wanted them to own all six. So we wrote about six. it. I thought there were five, but that's okay. I'll let there you come with the bonus things. All the, right. Well, don't, I'm not crazy. There's six. All and, right. and, you know, and we shared everything. Like Steve Richard said, like, you just put it all out there, sister. And I'm like, absolutely. We care about the community. We share our research for free. We're going to put this out there and hopefully people learn and love. Boom. Hey, Liz just bought your book on Amazon. My work is done. Thank you, have- Liz. Liz, you're a great woman. You're a genius. You're a goddamn genius. I love that. Yeah. Just like what took you so long? And, and then after you read it, go buy a bunch and share the wealth, right? Yes, right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So look, I'm gonna, I got some questions. Okay. Yeah. So yes, I read it. And I'm going to let everybody in a secret. Okay. I'm going to let everybody in a secret. Right now, I am developing a SaaS application that has nothing to do with sales. So I'll be launching a separate business or a subsidiary of a sales guy. And I am reading this not only as reaffirmation for what I know, what I think in my own sales consulting firm, but also how am I, what, to your point, what don't I know? And how is this going to help me develop uh, my own uh, inside sales team for yeah. this business that will be probably rolling out in the next 90 to 120 days, right? So yeah. I love it. Already got me thinking differently. But with that said, right out of the box, you did something I love. And you talked about AIDA or ADA, whatever they pronounce it. And that was phenomenal. You really set a powerful context. Tell everybody what this AIDA is and how you attached it to sales development. So ADA is what has been around forever. It's attention, interest, desire, and I don't know. But it's about action. action. Thank you. It's how you bring products to market. And it's been around forever. So what we wanted to do was, because the first section of the book is about strategy, is say to people, you think or you don't think about strategy in the right way. Because what happens is a VP of sales will be with a company. He's super successful. He goes, okay, we used to set introductory meetings there. I'm going to set introductory meetings at this company as opposed to qualified opportunities or any other sales development strategy. Well, it's not the same company. It's not the same buyer, you know, all those variables again, or a board will say, do this, or a CEO will say, do this. And I'm like, well, wait, this is the most important thing you can do. You need to think about it. So we created a framework called the five whys. Oh, it's awesome. Right? Why listen, why yep. care? Um, why change? Why you, why now? The five whys. And the first two, there you go. The first two are about why listen and why care. And those are really about sales development. And you have to decide how far down that food chain you want your sales development team to go based on the set of variables, which we also give you and let you work your way through that decision process. Because if your team needs at bats, you need to go with introductory meetings. But if they're super busy and they only need, you know, only give them opportunities further down the pipeline, then that's a whole different strategy with different skills and process and metrics and comp plans and leadership and you name it. So it ain't that easy. It ain't just buy a list, Hire some young, hungry reps, have them pound the phones, and revenue shoots out your ass. Doesn't work that way anymore, people. So, Damn it. That, Damn it. That's why we – I know. I know you were hopeful, but – I was. I was. I really lo- – I love this. I'm up here again. Because, guys, look at this, right? It's not just whys, but also before prospect, after prospect. Right, guys? I mean, corresponding sales stage, crazy – I mean, this is powerful. I-, I took a picture of this and put it on Twitter the other day. So I'm going to do it again or get a book and circle that and, and run with that, guys, because it is fantastic. How, yeah. does that affect, how does that affect organizations when they start? So I think, you know, if you're just starting out, so it's, let's say you're a startup. Yep. I'm going to make it simple for you and tell you that all you want your team to do is set introductory meetings because you have to have as many conversations as possible to figure out, is my message resonating? Should I start high and go top down? Should I go bottom up? Um, Is it resonating with the CFO, but not the CEO? You got to have as many conversations as possible to really validate your go-to-market strategy. So it's, it's about at bats for you. So that's introductory meetings, you know, and there are certain, like enterprise sales, you know, should it be introductory meetings or should it be qualified opportunities? It really depends. 
that's why we laid out the framework and we help people make those decisions. Okay, so good. So then the talk was, how do you define the difference? Because I know you talk about the book between introductory meetings and qualified opportunity meetings. And, and yep. what are some of the two or three things that a company should really take into consideration before deciding which one of those they want their SDS focused on? Okay, so it is, it's about at bats. Do you need more conversations or do you need more real opportunities in your pipeline? Or do you need both? Because that's the other mistake people make is they think it's a, I only can have one sales development strategy when you can have multiple strategies in play. I'll tell you where we're seeing a problem though yes. with people that are setting introductory meetings, you know, if it's not working and they're not getting the kind of conversions they want, you know, they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, can you look at my sales development team? Something's not right. And 90% of the time, they're looking at the wrong end of the donkey, right? Because not a lot of salespeople have the ability to take an introductory meeting and to turn it into an opportunity, right? Salespeople have got used to being handed things in, in process and then running with them. And they don't really know how to have a conversation with someone where they have to plant the seed, plant the vision. So if you go with the introductory meeting strategy, you better train your sales organization and train the them super well. The AEs. The the AEs just, yes, okay. Just for clarity, but she says train your sales org. She's talking about the account executives, the people that hand it yep. off to you. It's sort, of like, it's sort of like saying, look, I'm going to throw the ball in the sucker. I'm throwing it. You better be able to catch the damn thing. That's exactly it. Okay, that's a great point. Great point. Like so, t Tom Brady. Huh, Keenan? This huh? season... The man was throwing the ball and throwing the ball and throwing the ball and nobody was catching it. Nobody was there to catch it. And they kept knocking my board down all year. It was just, it was a tough year for the Patriots. We, we had a great team. The injuries killed us because we had all the injuries. Yeah. Side note. Yeah. I mean, Super Bowl yeah. was ours. I mean, we, we, we had a chance. Yeah, don't get me going. I know. I know. I know. Bad Jesus. calls. Bad calls, too. That was Missed like, field goal. Missed field goal. I mean, missed yeah. extra point. Anyway, so we yeah. digress. Ooh, all right, here we go. So you get this all worked up. All right, so, so understanding that, then you're talking about introductory calls, you're talking about setting appointments and all this. This leads to another interesting question. Should people be focused on inbound or outbound? So I think they need to be focused on all bound. Ooh, all bound. I like that. All bound. And that and we do talk about that in the book. So That's I guess stop I saying that. That's why I have well, to read it okay and so keen yeah okay i'm trying to i'm trying to tell you remember we did i'll throw it you gotta catch it okay i know <laughs> right, i know i know <laughs> getting knocked down all right so inbound is awesome right what's better than someone saying hey please talk to me or identifying themselves as someone who potentially wants to talk to you i do love inbound but i was saying it's with inbound you get what you get and with outbound you get what you want and therein lies a difference, right? Oh. So I think you have to have both strategies in play. You have to be super smart about both. I mean, I think anyone who chases every single inbound lead, like, what are you doing? You only have so many resources. Like, I personally don't agree with the, the person who talks to the person who downloaded your white paper first wins. <laughs> are you kidding me? They, they haven't even thought about it yet. So I have some definite opinions about inbound. I'm a huge outbound fan. Go get what you want. Do yeah. it smart. Do it smart. So my theory is all bound. Okay. So you, you have some, yeah, so you got some grit. So for all of those linear analyticals listening, this isn't just an emote responsive woman's perspective. You have some good research on this. Do you not? We do. And we actually just released our 2016 sales development metrics and compensation report yesterday. Best one ever. Like it's crazy filled with information and it's free because we want to educate the community. So go download that um, at blog.bridgegroupinc.com or on our resources page. Because, yeah, the research is really interesting. Okay, A couple areas I one. didn't expect. You had one, but you were talking about inbound versus outbound, right? Yeah. The percentage of marketing source pipeline. Right? Would you like yeah. me to read this for you or do you remember it? I do not remember it, and it will have changed based on the research report that I just mentioned. <laughs> Look at me, like, what? Yeah. Um, you know, it averages about 42%. Yes. It, it's yeah. actually, it's higher for under, I, um, in our research report we just released, it's about 62% 
for SaaS companies with zero to five million in revenues, which makes sense. Yeah, that, that is inbound. That is in, they get their leads from inbound. No, that's their sourced pipeline, whether it's inbound or outbound. It's their all born, all bound source pipeline. All, so where does the rest come from? Uh, I don't know. Maybe the salespeople need to prospect or referrals or customers or the executive team using their network. So that's yeah, all bound. Any, that's all, all bound. bound, not inbound versus outbound. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So there you have it, people. How much do you think comes from inbound? How much do you think comes from outbound? Depends on the company. So if you're doing you, all bound selling? and you had to guess, if, you had, if you're doing all bound and you had to guess, what do you think that ratio is? I'd like to see it at 50-50, but you, once again, that's, I can't give you a generic answer because listen to, listen to why. If I'm a commodity play, like my, my average deal size is $3,000, I'm a commodity play selling into the laggard space of the technology market, outbound doesn't even make sense for me, right? I'm just going to market and be all inbound, right? But if I'm um, an enterprise deal selling, you know, say, or even a fifty, seventy-five thousand dollar deal selling into innovators and early adopters, I got to go outbound. They're not going to find me. They don't even know they have a problem. So I think you got to figure out what should your mix be based on a bunch of different variables. Bingo, love it. All right, yeah. good stuff. You're killing it, sister. You're killing it. I don't know how to keep up. All right, then. Uh, hey, Doug's got a great oh, question. All right, you want to answer Doug's question? So great book, Trish, is there any content or concepts that you would have liked to add in the book after it was published? Yes. And I guess that's always going to be the case. I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time on social, um, which we're a big believer in. And the reason we didn't spend a lot of time there is because once again, why talk about something unless you know that your buyers are there. You got to fish where your buyers swim and to come out with generic social strategies. If I'm selling into a manufacturing vertical and my guy is the plant manager, didn't make sense. So we lightly touched on social, um, but maybe there'll be an addendum to the book coming out someday that takes a deeper dive. That's one thing. The other thing is account-based sales development. Uh, didn't get into it because once again, it's a very specific strategy. It's a huge buzzword, right? Account-based marketing, account-based sales development. I love what Craig Rosenberg said about it at Topo, account-based everything. Awesome. Loved his presentation. So, but it, you know, under 50K doesn't make sense. So those are two things that maybe someday will come out with addendums to the book. But thanks for asking the question, oh, Doug. Way to go, Dougie. Dougie Fresh. All right, so with that, let's talk about accounts and let's talk about companies. ICPs, I'm going to mess with you. What are the ABCDs of the ICP? So I think you've memorized my – I actually think you've memorized my book better than I have. Can you give me a, a page? You should, you should know me, but two, a, I don't fuck around. Okay? I guess you do. Okay. All right, so what do we so, say to people? ABCDs, right? This is the, the, um, the, uh, the ideal customer profile. Right. Yes. In the A, B, C, D. I love that. I loved it. Of course, I wrote that all up. Right. A list, bread and butter, compelling events. Talk to everybody about this and why it's important. Okay. More importantly, why is it important? Okay. So here's what happens. We go to talk to companies and we're like, "What's your What's your sweet spot? Where are you focused?" And they're like, "Oh, we're a horizontal play," or you know, oh, "We can sell to anyone," or you know, "Everybody." everybody's a prospect or it's, you know, fortune 2000. And I'm like, Oh my God, we are so screwed here because you only have so many resources, right? You can buy a gun, but unless you learn how to point the gun and shoot the gun, you're never going to hit the target. Maybe guns, a bad analogy. How about a bow? Well, I think it's a great analogy because technically All right, well, there you go. What, what's a gun for? It can shoot anybody. Really? So you're going to shoot anybody. Okay. Right. Well, no, not any, but that's a great analogy actually because the gun technically speaking can take anybody out. But if you start using it that way, you're in some serious trouble. Right. Especially in the state of Massachusetts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but not in Texas so much. Not in Texas so much. Maybe I'll be moving. <laughs> Who knows? But so the point is, and where we spend a lot of time with our clients is saying, no, seriously, what's your sweet spot? So here's how we want you to think about your market. So your A accounts are those accounts that I want them, I got to have them. Got to, got to, got to have them. They're, they're in the right vertical. They have the right revenue size or employee count or using the right technology, whatever it is. They're my 
oh my God, we have a huge conversion rate for these people, right? Because that's one strategy that you're going to apply against that. B accounts, bread and butter. They're, they're everybody else. They're, they're probably going to buy from us. We're probably going to have to educate them. Their prob deal size probably isn't going to be as big, but you know what? They're still a play for us and we're going to pay attention for them. C accounts for compelling events. Don't know about them, haven't really sold there before, kind of think that we probably should be, but if there's a compelling event or a trigger event, bam, we're on it. And then the D accounts, and please admit that you have them because you do, are just dead. dead, dead. Blah. Don't spend any resources there. So once again, once you ABCD your accounts, you can have really unique strategies against them. Maybe in the A accounts, you do account-based everything. For your B accounts, you do all bound. For your C accounts, you set up a process that gets you to those compelling events. And for those D accounts, I don't care if Joe Loser downloaded every piece of content you have. He's still a loser. Ignore him. So that's what ABCD was about. Oh, God. Ignore the losers. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. All right. So uh, I, I think I'm with you on this one. I see this a lot. The idea that people don't really understand the type of accounts they're going after, their right? Right. ideal customer profile is a killer. They just think everybody is a customer. Everybody is someone they can sell to. And I, I think what you're alluding to in addition to all this is the fact that this lost time. If you don't pay attention, you can lose time focused on these people and not be able to move. So it's about efficiency and effectiveness as well, right? Making sure that you're spending the right time on the right people. Yeah resources time is your most precious commodity so time and resources so if you're not focusing them you know we had one of our clients from a long time ago a fabulous company out of pennsylvania believe it or not called list track um they were selling horizontally and we did an engagement with them and i had one slide that just said those who focus are those who win and the ceo still talks about it he's like all the money I gave you, I would have paid just for that one slide and how it changed our business. Because they did ABCD out their accounts and they are a super high growth company doing extremely well. Once again, their name is List Track and um, it was all based on focus. List Track. List Track is getting a little plug here. See, now, yes. now, he really earned, now he, you really earned your money from him. Now it's the slide and a little love on this show, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Trish, you said something else in the book, I, I, and you know me, I always like when people deviate from the norm or push the envelope or toss something out that's not uh, normally used or expected. The research cap, you actually suggest that people pay a person to do just research. Really? Yes. Well, it once again, it depends. Variables, variables, variables. So if your SDRs, who are not inexpensive in any way, shape, or form, and can be super effective at filling your pipeline, if they're spending even one second figuring out who to call or how to get at them or if they fit your sweet spot, what are you doing? Like, you know, nobody likes to spend money on the boring stuff. And, and I have this, another one of my Trishisms, as I call them, I call it the double D's. You got to pay attention to the double yeah, D's. Yeah, pay attention to the right? double D's. I like this one. Yes, I got, Trish. And, and it ain't here. It's not here. It, no, no. It's a strategy, <laughs> right? So the double D's are data and dialers. Nobody wants to invest in data because it's so not sexy. Yeah. Go spend your money there. Get up a headcount. Go get some great data. There's some fabulous companies out there doing fabulous things. And I think Henry's on here. And if you are Henry, yep, now may be a time to offer some sort of special deal for the listeners. But <laughs> I just think, you know, data's number one in dialers. Once you have those aside, then you can go look at everything else. But you know, from a productivity perspective, hiring someone to go do research and populate your database with the right guy, with the right title, direct dial, phone number, what their tech stack looks like, or whatever else your parameters are. Cheap money people, stop being cheap. Salespeople do not cure all ills. Have Penny one less salesperson. 
That's it. Tom All right, so I'm digging this. So because I like it so much, I want to dig deeper, right? So I'm, if, if you've just convinced me, I'm sitting here and I've got 22 inside sales reps doing all bound. I've got, I got eight uh, account executives taking that stuff. And I'm hearing you and I'm like, oh, damn, she might be right. Uh, what do I do? Give me more. How do I look for this person? How, what type of information do I want them to look for? What is the process for, you know, for getting information in there? How do I do it? Give me more. Help me with the execution. Yeah. So, you know, I think interns, that's a great use for an intern, right? A college intern. Um, maybe some of your employees have kids who are in college looking for a part-time job. What a great use of time. We could train them on what data sources to use and where to go get the data and how to make calls to find it out or um, hire, be, be original with this, right? So I think like stay-at-home moms who used to be in sales and want to keep their hand in the game, what an untapped market. Why can't they work at home, do this role for you, then maybe move into a part-time SDR role? Veterans, right? Veterans coming out of the service and thank you for your service so much. Let's get them into our companies in maybe a role like this and then train them and move them up through the ranks. It doesn't have to be, let me go find the perfect person to do this perfect role. It's a role that you can train someone on and I'm asking you to be creative with who you bring into it because there's a lot of deserving people out there. How do I know what type of information I want them to get? How do I determine that? Because look, you, I, I can already see this trip. I can already see someone getting not enough information, but then I yeah. always see someone be like, all right, you need to get all this. And the person spends two hours on one account because they're trying to get everything. How do they know what the balance is? Well, it's, it's not about them qualifying the opportunity, right? Their job is data. So, you know, we have this, you want to be you want to have enough information that you can start a conversation. So is this an A or B account? Because you're not going to focus this person on the C or D. Oh, look, we're going back to stuff we already learned. See, people, this is connected. Nice. Yep. All right. See? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Full circle, baby. Full circle. <laughs> so, you know, it really depends. What do you need to know about a company so that your SDRs can go have a smart conversation? Do you need to know simplistic things like employee count or revenue size? Or do you need to know technology stack? Or do you need to know if you're a rip and replace technology? Do you need to know when their contract expires? It really depends. It's all about once you define your ideal customer profile, you're going to know what pieces of data allow you to start a conversation. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. So Trish, tell me the number one problem that you see with sales develop inside of organizations where they're trying to execute against sales development? The number one problem. I don't think people understand the power of number one, the double D's. I'm going back to that data and dialers. There's so many technologies out there that are so fun and sexy. Let's just go basic double D's. Um, and I think the other thing is people don't understand the power of time blocking for their sales development team. Ooh. So like we, and Jill Conrath has done a ton of research on this topic and I got to um, speak with her at Dreamforce last year on the topic, but we think we multitask well, we absolutely suck at it. And it's probably the biggest drain on business resources today. Multitasking doesn't work. Like, I don't know if you've read about the Pomodoro technique to keep people focused, but sales development reps are so busy that they literally can hop from task to task to task to task, but never accomplish much. They're, they're confusing activity with moving the ball forward. So simple things, right? Simple things like time blocking. So... <laughs> <laughs> this amount of time I'm going to spend going after new people. Then my next hour, I'm going to follow up on everyone I'm already engaged with. And my next hour, I'm going to do some social stuff. That level of focus in their role, I think, is is a critical success factor that people think it's a negative. Oh, I don't want to put them in a box and I don't want to be too structured. Shut up. Do it. Right. You they just probably graduated from college. They spent their yeah. whole lives with right? They just yeah. spent their whole lives with people telling them what to do. Just tell them what to do. 
Uh, you know, I like that. I'm going to add a piece to this and give me a two cents. So I agree with that, with that chunking. And, and Kira was giving me some of this a minute ago because we just recently had a conversation similar to this. So I like the idea of chunking. And you talk about it in your book. But I like to add one other thing that I'm starting to call campaigning, right? Yeah. Because campaigning is what I call is, is the connectivity or the mortar between the bricks. So if one minute I'm, I'm going to do a little social, and that's what makes some calls. And the next time I do some research, if I don't do those in a campaign connected oriented fashion, I I'm still going to end up in the same place in many ways, right? So I got to ask myself, okay, I'm going to do social right now, but for what and connected to what as it relates to my call? And yeah. Oh, he was on a roll. Connected too. to what? Is enough if it's not oh, there he is. Oops. And he's out. Oh, shit. In and out. I think you're In back. Just keep going because okay. you're on a roll. I was on a roll. I was just talking about the idea that if you can't say, if, if you can't connect everything, you can chunk this stuff for days and still end up in the same place. You have to understand how it all connects. And my social campaign connected to my calling campaign connected to my research has to be connected for an end result. So love you because you absolutely just nailed something here. Here's another kind of, you are actually articulated it better than I did. So thank you for that. Because if your SDRs are selling to multiple buyers and they are, it's usually three, maybe four. How do I go from having a conversation with the VP of sales, which is using one language to having a conversation with the CFO, which is another to having a conversation with the VP of marketing, which is another, I can't switch from French, Italian and German in my head that quickly. So campaign focused, meaning everything I'm going to do today is going to be focused on that buyer type versus the next day, a different buyer type or somehow structuring that I think is super, super brilliant. Why didn't I put that in the book? Hey, next Dingo, time. Doug, there's your question right there, Doug, because you didn't call me for after my insight. Look, man, you know, if I do anything right, I think a little differently. All right. Yeah. So with that said, and then teach people what's not taught. Oh, and, ooh, and teach people what's not taught. Poof, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was good, Susan. That was good. But I just hey, love you. I love you back. But I have a question for you about your book, which is actually fabulous for anyone who hasn't read it yet. Um, I love the fact that it's your voice that I hear on every page. And I love the fact that in Amazon, you put it under self-help and not yeah. sales. Yeah. So I have a question for you. I'm going to flip this around. Why did you choose to do that? Because it's not a sales book. It's a, it's a self-help book, right? There is one chapter on sales, and that is learn how to sell. And most of that chapter is about the importance of being able to understand how to create value for other people, how we measure value, and then how to create uh, – it's a framework for someone to understand how to sell. So if you're trying to get, a, if you're trying to get someone to – um, uh, buy, I mean, by trying to get someone to buy into a new product that you have at work or a new idea or a new process, you've got to understand how to present that in a way that the people give you a chance. And so that's just one chapter, but the rest is, is, is all about what the life skills of the 21st century requires that no one's teaching us. They're still teaching us the, the industrial age, yeah. 20th century shit. So it is self-help. People who read this, and I know you follow me on Twitter. People who read this, they're coming back. Oh my God, this changed my life. I did this. I did this. I just got a job off. And this, this, this. That's self help. That's not sales. Yeah, you're right. I guess I just re I read it with I read everything with my sales filter on. But anyway, the book's yeah. called Not Taught. <laughs> available on Amazon. <laughs> and it's excellent. And the check is in the mail. The check is in the yeah. mail. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Your your four dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. Thank you very much. All right. So with that said, so let's talk about one of my favorite subjects when it comes to anything, right? And someone asked me this the other day, I was doing a podcast and, and somebody asked me, you know, I do four things in my consulting practice, strategy, structure, people, and process. And they asked me which one is the most important. I always say unequivocally, hands down, as tight as it may sound, it's people. Because yeah. people are the sharp end of the spear. If they can't execute, the rest doesn't matter, Right. So look at Cindy Little F or whatever. She's the bomb, man. She just goes out and buys she, shit. She just say it. She does it. <laughs> she is the bomb. And let me tell you something. She's also a brilliant consultant. Oh, oh, oh got it. Got it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. Thank you. She's one of our senior book. consultants. Yeah, she'll love it. It's, it's like so her style. 
I don't ask why you haven't bought it for your whole team, but that's a whole different story for a different day. <laughs> that will that will happen today. Yeah, there you go. See, You'll there you see go. a little spike. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so let's talk about people. You've got a whole section here, and justifiably so, I would have been disappointed if you didn't on hiring and recruiting and sourcing, yep. right? Yeah. Talk to me about. I know we can't get through it all, but I, I want yeah. you to talk about the three. Uh, what I, you call the three traits of qualified candidates. I love this because it's unexpected. What are the three traits of qualified candidates? So I change my mind on that almost every day. So, <laughs> I mean, I think curiosity is key. I mean, uh, you know, I and I'll be honest with you. I didn't memorize my, my own book. I have to be honest. But, I mean, curiosity is key. I think um, the someone who wants to learn their craft, I think – so someone who's a lifelong learner, oh, I wish I could see it. And, passion, and, and what people call passion. passion, yeah, you have to be super passionate about it. And, you know, the problem is there aren't enough people to fill the roles. Yeah. Competitiveness? Um, yes and no on competitiveness. I mean, if we talk about empathy, empathy as being... Uh, a competitive feature. You know, you can't, you don't want someone who's going to kill everyone else on the team to win. You want someone who's empathetic and wants the whole team to win, just happens to want to be at the top of the leaderboard. But the funny thing is the people that talk to me about that section, when I start probing them on, on their hiring process, um, it's, it's so different from company to company. And w what I think it's lacking is brevity. So what I'd like to share with your audience today is I'm going to give you the 40-second interview. Ready? And I don't care if it's SDRs. I don't, I don't care if you're interviewing for a CEO. This is what you do. You get them on the phone and you say to the person, okay, great. So glad that I get the chance to talk to you today, Keenan. What do you know about me and what do you know about my business? And if they don't nail that interview over, move on. Go to Dairy Queen. Wow. Get an ice cream cone. I hope everybody's they, listening to that. Yeah, the 40-second interview. It's just like if they haven't invested in the most critical component of their relationship with you, kick them to the curb. You don't owe them half an hour. People are like, well, I got to talk to him. He's here. or you know, He's on the phone for half an hour. Nah. Click, click. Bye-bye. There's some truth to that, and, and Kiki will speak to it. I, people hate interviewing with me. You should see people. I have people come in all excited to work for a sales guy. And within 15, 20 minutes, they, one person even wrote a note. Max is listening. They wrote a note to Max and said, I have never been so offended in a job interview in my entire life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It went off. And the bottom line was I just drilled them with questions they couldn't answer. And I challenged them on something they, they didn't do. We asked them to do something in the interview, uh, in the uh, uh, application process. They didn't do it. I said, well, why didn't you do it? And she explained. And I said, well, how does that align with our culture? Because I don't see the map. Oh, my gosh. So, yes, people, you can, you, my point is you can offend people in the interview. You can. Don't worry about it, people. Just go for it. Um, <laughs> offend. Because that's how they're to... feeling. That's how they're feeling. You can't be offensive, but you can offend. If you end an interview oh, absolutely. short. absolutely. If you end an interview short because they don't know anything about you, I promise you they will tell people they're offended. Yeah, and have at it. Yeah, like, it, like, have at it. I actually think when I interview people, and I'm a terrible interviewer, I bad, el saco. I'm not allowed to interview here at the Bridge Group because in five minutes I'm like, oh, I really like her. Or, no, oh, did you see his shoes? They were all scuffy. No, that's not going to work for us. Yeah, so I'm not allowed to interview here. But, um, it's a process is my point. And you need to invest in the process and really think it through. Like in the book, we talk about people um, apply online. Give them a web survey. See how many of your online candidates actually even take it and invest the time or just see if they're resume blasting. I mean, there's a lot of great ideas. The other thing I want to point out for anyone who hasn't read the book yet is if you're not paying attention to Glassdoor, then yeah, you really about are, that. Like you're really an idiot. You are an idiot idiot and i'm going to put it out there if you're not looking at your glass door is like yelp or TripAdvisor for for travel and for restaurants 
you should see some of the things we see on Glassdoor. If you don't think people are running to Glassdoor when they know they're going to interview you to decide if they even want to, guess what? You are wrong. So go read that chapter and get it fixed. I was amazed how much you put that in there. Now you got me wanting to go check out. And I should be amazed because we have actually, in our recruiting side of the business, we've actually yeah. lost who yeah. <laughs> went out the glass door, saw, um, saw a bad review, said, I want no part of that. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, we're going to open up this to questions. We got, uh, who do we have here? We got, okay. He's got a question. He's coming in here. We'll see. Oh, I love that. Isn't this cool, Trish? It's so cool. Is this your first time? On? Oh, he's gone. Okay, the seat is open. I don't know so what Conrad, happened. Mr. Conrad, want to pop in here? Come on in, Conrad. Let's have some fun, baby. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh -oh. Where's my Red Bull? Where's my Red Bull? Here you go, sister. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I have, here. A, I, I have a red cup. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for um, Red Bull to sponsor me, getting on my nerves. Even if it's just to shit me to stuff. Conrad. Here he comes. What's up, guys? Hey, hey. what's up, Conrad, baby? How you doing, my man? I, uh, you know, I was interested in kind of the, you know, the different categories of leads, you know, the A through the D. Um, but I was curious, and also about the ICP uh, conversation, but I was curious if you would recommend or if you've seen people kind of put like that D category and really detail it out. You know, like say, these are all the qualities of that D category. So kind of like an anti-ICP. Yeah. So first of all, <clears throat> ABCD is not a lead status. Well, I guess it could be, but it's a more a way to frame your market and to segment your market type. So it's not like they did something that put them in the A, it's that you thought it through and put them in the ABCD. Mm -hmm. But I think for the anti-ICP, I think what's super interesting is sometimes you can put someone into D after you have a conversation with them. Like when we build for our clients the ideal customer profile data sheet or whatever, there's something called um, red flags to watch out for. Because I could be having a conversation with you and you mention something, I go, never going to buy from us. And so your SDRs and your salespeople need to know that too. So I guess it would be, we call it red flags, but I guess it would be anti-ICP. Ooh, I might steal that from you, Conrad. <laughs> I just might. Hey, is this like the Brady Bunch thing? Is this like the Brady Bunch thing? Exactly. Exactly. Feel free to send me any checks. I'll send you the information. No. Uh, yeah, no. that'd be great. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that, that was my, my main question. Uh, that makes sense. But red flags kind of fits within your kind of the way of thinking about the ICP. Cool. Yeah, anti-ICP. If we start using it, I will most assuredly let you know. Awesome. Sounds good. All, All right. right. Thank you, my man. You got it. Thanks for showing up. You got it, brother. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Who's next? Who's got another question? We can take some more. Um, what, and feel free just to press that button and jump in. It's open for anybody who wants it. Don't be shy. Uh, and until someone presses on that, uh, let's talk a little bit about retention, Trish. Yeah. I got yeah. some good stuff there, right? So yeah. I really like what you did. About, I'm probably, you're probably going to be pissed when I ask you this. Because, oh, I don't remember my own book. But you had some great stuff or get around tenure expectations. That chart that said add and subtract. I love oh. that. I know, right? Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. It was freaking brilliant. Yes. Well, Tell people. so the whole well, so here's the whole thing about retention. I think it's the least talked about topic. And it should be so at the top of everyone's list, right? Everyone talks about recruiting and hiring and like, okay, the average SDR tenure, once again, based on the research we released yesterday, I think, is 1.4 years. And I'm one, yeah, so that's what? 16 months. If your ramp time is four months, you get 12 months out of, a, of, out of an SDR. Uh, what do you think would happen to your pipeline if you could increase that by 75% or, or, or more? I mean, your pipeline would be way more robust. So we spend a lot of time in the book talking about how do you keep people in their seats? And there's a couple different strategies. One is to create a learning culture because learning is the new coin of the realm. 
And people care more about adding skills to their resume than they do about money at this point in time and with where they are in their careers. As they should. As they should. As they should always. So I think that's critical. And the other one is the reason we lose a lot of SDRs through attrition is we've they've got, got this up or out mentality, right? I gotta be you gotta move me up or I'm leaving. So they hop. And what that's sort of a misnomer. What they really want is to learn new things. So I talked about this at Rainmaker, and I don't know um, if you were able to attend that part of my session, but micro promotions have become part of the, are becoming part of the culture. So if someone wants to learn, give them the ability to learn and promote them so they can learn. The other thing that we're seeing as a challenge is that 64% of SDRs that go from SDR to AE without the right kind of structure and training fail. Well, why shouldn't they? They barely know how to qualify and now you're asking them to close. So sort of how you build that learning culture supported by micro promotions is something, it's like one of my favorite, favorite parts of the book and I'd, I'd love everyone to read it and give me their feedback. All right. So that is really good. I'm really digging the micro promotion piece. So because I'm so excited about this, I, I know I'm not going to be able to read it, but here is it. By the way, if anybody hasn't seen the theme or the trend here, Bertuzzi loves her fucking tables. Okay. <laughs> and this, this book is filled with tables, people. There is like Microsoft, Microsoft table feature is burned out. I mean, look at table after table. She loves her tables, but they're good. There's good shit in her. Look at that big table. Look at that big table right there. I mean, for those of you who are listening to this on iTunes, sorry, but just imagine a Microsoft table every page and a half, and she loves her tables. But with that said, you said some neat stuff in one of these tables, air quotes. Yes. One of them is uh, SDR baseline, eight months. So an impressive company name, add two months. Yep. Good positive culture. Add three months. Yep. Great learning environment. Add four months. Yep. Define career path. Add six months. So guys, these are all adding months to the tenure of the sales development rep. Here's the flip side, though, guys. Listen, hiring green candidates subtract two months. Cut uh, cutthroat competitive environment subtract three months. Subpar compensation subtract three months, four months, and then no SDR to AE path subtracts six months. I mean, this was really, really cool at illustrating, Trish, the impact of certain elements of an organization to the retention. Yeah. Feel free to share that with your recruiting clients. You can gonna... take that. To... Yeah. Take that table and share it. All right. Not that book. <laughs> that book is all for you. But yeah, that table. And, and let me talk to you about the tables, though, because I think we headed in that direction with it because um, ideas are, first of all, I'm a visual person. So ideas for me are easier to absorb when I can look at them in sort of a framework. So we went with a lot of tables because, quite frankly, I'm not that smart. So I the needed to be awesome. able to understand. Yeah. The tables yeah. are awesome. No defense needed. Yeah. I just had to have fun. It's my trish. I had yeah. to have fun. Yeah. Oh, I'm absolutely. Yeah. All together, getting into my it, cube. <laughs> hey, I'm all about That's the four awesome. quadrant. I'm all about the four quadrant matrix. You can't sit in a meeting with me for more than an hour. I'll I'll make one out of the damn blue. Like, oh look. So I'm with you. I'm right there with you, sister. All, all right. right. The last thing I want to talk about real quickly, and then we are at the end of our time, is coaching. And I'm a huge mm. fan of coaching. Uh, you have a Thank lot you. on this. So again, we won't be able to get it all. And based on your senior years, you probably can't remember it all anyway. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What? Did that come out of my mind? <laughs> uh, I'm just recovering from that abacus comment. And now you're giving me this. Uh, was that not great? You got to give me credit. You opened it up. I just walked through the door. Uh, do you know, I said it on the stage. I told everyone that you were mean to me on the stage when I was at Rainmaker. <laughs> I told them your abacus comment. It got a huge laugh. I'll give you that. <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad I can help give you your, your content, right? There you go. All right. Um, all right. Talk to me. So you talk about something called prep, land, expand, cement. Can you remember all that? And would you like to share with me? 
<laughs> what are we talking about? Yes, coaching and prep, yeah. land, expand, cement. Yeah. So the thing about coaching is, you know, everyone, when, when we talk to people, they're like, oh, I absolutely do coaching. And then you peel back the onion. And what they mean is doing these horrific one-on-ones, Ooh, right? Horrific, horrific. Right? So yeah. I think the thing about coaching is you have to tell people what you expect from them and allow them to prepare. Like some people are great thinking on their feet. Some people aren't. So allow setting their expectation about what's going to, what your expectation of them is and what their expectation of you should be, I think is great. I think you have to be consistent with your coaching. Um, I think you have to know and some of this is in the book, and I'm kind of going off-road with some of this because I've had so many conversations about it lately, but people don't know how to coach. No one's ever been taught how to coach. How do you give feedback in a way that is positively received? And, like, how do you give feedback? Like, I'm a, a visual person. Like, if you give me feedback, I want it to be, you know, in, in the written – so in a table, preferably, but in a way that I can absorb it and think about it and read it at my pace while other people are audio. You need to know all these things to be an effective coach. And it's not something we just promote or hire from outside. We don't teach people how to coach. And it's, it's just a shame because coaching is one of the big reasons that people stick around. If there's a coaching environment, your retention uh, goes up dramatically. So. No, I, I coach is a huge one. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of coaching. I'm about to finish an ebook on coaching. Um, I have a, a methodology that I, I borrowed from my teaching of skiing instruction called yep. observe, describe, prescribe. And then after reading Mark Robert's book, he has something called apply and absorb. And yep. so we married the two together because one is the responsibility of the coach. The other is the responsibility of the coachee. And so now what we have is this very holistic coaching methodology that says the coach is to observe the behaviors. Right. Yep. That's just the fact that you watch. Then yep. you have to describe what you see, not what you don't see. You describe what you see that person yep. doing. Then from there, you prescribe what you would like them to do as an alternative. Right. Yeah. Then coming upon the coachee to take that and do they absorb what you told them? Right. So you have to start to see, do they understanding what I share with them? Are they understanding what I've described to them? Are they understanding what I prescribed to them? And yeah. then from out there, can they apply it? Are they, absolutely, are they able to apply what I've shared with them and what they've observed? And then from there, you then start all over again. Okay, I start to watch their application. Yeah. I then describe what I saw in the application. I prescribe alternatives. They absorb it. They apply it. Repeat. And so that's uh, a methodology that we've grabbed a hold of that I think is absolutely critical. And I, I'm glad you have this in the book. Well, actually... I love the fact that you wrote or are writing the ebook based on your um, experiences as a ski instructor because, you know, it's outside of that's human behavior, that's yeah. human interaction. Sometimes sales is in a little silo and people don't view it as real world. So I'm looking forward to that ebook because so it's, it's human behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, let me know when it's there. Yes, I will. Yes, Kiki. What's up, sister? Did you see? Um, we had a really good question from Conrad again, um, talking about have you ever seen or what are your thoughts, your high level thoughts on lumping the SDR role with the marketing team? Mm -hmm. um, and then he made an insight on how he can see um, how it might not be as direct of a path for people who want to be sales contributors if right. the function is owned by marketing. Okay. So, Thanks, Conrad, for the question. Um, we know through our research that 76% of all sales development teams now report to sales. So that's most assuredly a norm. We've been tracking it since 2007, and it's been trending that way ever since. The teams that do report to marketing tend to be inbound only. So those people who are just following up on marketing leads. Having said that, here's how I feel about where the team should promote. It doesn't matter to me. I wanted to report to the person who has the passion, the bandwidth, and the expertise to make the team successful. I don't care what organization that falls under. So passion, bandwidth, expertise, right? 
that matters to me. The other thing that's important to remember is we need to get our head out of our asses and it's that SDRs want to be AEs. They want to be AEs because we're telling them they want to be AEs. It's probably their first or second job out of college. They didn't go get a job as an SDR going, oh, yippee, put me on the phone all day, suffering massive rejection. Woohoo, can't wait. <laughs> you know, they landed there for like one dumbass reason or another. And now maybe they're enjoying the company. What I want people to think about is if you have a talented person in the SDR seat, Keep them in your company umbrella. Talk, let them go hang out with finance if they were a finance major. Let them go hang out with account development, customer success, marketing, customer support, engineering. We're in, we have such huge egos in sales that we think, oh, everybody wants to be in sales. Not true. Don't lose the talent. Keep it under your company umbrella. That's my rant. Boom. And I love it when... Because I was on a sales desk and I loved it when other sales reps moved on to national accounts to marketing strategy. Then you have that connection up there. They understand the sales process, what the conversations you're having every day actually yeah. sound like. Well, I think it's great. You're so right. Look at Sean Kester from Rainmaker. Moved over into product management. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant from Rainmaker. I mean, from Sales Loft. That was the best that Kyle made. Freaking, oh my God. Best well, one of them. He, he does. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I actually like Tammy McQueen too, but oh, yeah, Anthony Zhang. And there's a million people over there. <clears throat> there's a million there. Yes. But um, keep them in your keep them in the talent pool. That's that's my mantra. Good mantra. Good yep. mantra. All right. With that, yep. with that, folks. Last chance for romance. Anybody have another question? <laughs> a bit. You do crack me up. I try. I try. Right. All right, people. Yeah. You you have had your chance in your hour of power with Miss Trish Bertuzzi, Double D Bertuzzi. Ooh, Double D Bertuzzi. <laughs> Bam. Uh, it's actually Double Z, but whatever. <laughs> well, all right. So, oh yeah, it is. Isn't it? Was, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> oh, 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 stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> All right, so listen, um, everybody, thank you very much for showing up to this uh, episode 25 of The Word. Uh, that's a half of the year of words. We're excited. Again, this is our opportunity to share with you real, live, real, actionable sales information, steps, and actions without boring your ass off. So who do we got next? We got a really good person. We, we're booked up till June or July. Who's next? Next up, we have Mr. Carlos Gill. He's joining us April 7th, same time, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, everybody's talking about Snapchat as being one of like the top social media networks to start talking about, start incorporating. We're going to be talking about Snapchat as it specifically relates, relates to sales and inbound marketing and how that can affect your does it? Does it? Can you even use Snapchat for sales? Look, there's a lot of debate going on right now on whether or not Snapchat is a viable sales and marketing uh, social media tool. I'm staying out of the fray. I'm using it, but I'm going to let Carlos, who has built an amazing audience and has been extremely active on on uh, Snapchat, to explain to you how, because he said yes. So that is our next word two weeks from today. So outside of that, folks, stay with us. If you have any questions, you know where to find me, at Keenan. We got at Wu-Tang Bunny. I want to thank very much Miss Trish Bertuzzi for showing up. She is the bomb. Great inside stuff, guys. Go buy her book, The Sales Development Playbook. If you have a sales development team, you need to get it to make it better. If you're thinking about a sales development team, you get it, need to get it to make it right. So make it better and make it right. You can't lose. Trish, thank you so much, sister. We really love hanging it. out with you guys. You, Thank you. You are the bomb, the bomb. So until next time, peace, peace. I'm out. Peace. Yeah. <laughs>